Murder Over a Cup of Tea is one of those first long poems that I've written somewhere nearly in 4,000 words. And it was my attempt to create a play-like atmosphere where there are some intriguing characters who exchange dialogues between them within the poem and the whole poem builds an atmosphere where something dubious is happening. There are characters like a husband whose name I've chosen to keep Mr. Husband and his wife whom you would meet as Mrs. Wife and there's a suspecting fellow who doubts that she has been murdered and there comes a man who is investigating the whole case. He is Mr. Longnose or I should say Detective Longnose because he sniffs all the time in other people's businesses and then there are the townspeople, the judge and some other small characters whom you will meet after each scene unravels. Good evening everyone. This is Mona Lisa Joshi and this uh, today we are here to enjoy the first ever poetic drama that we are doing live uh, on the page of the Vana talk show which is a sister concern of Chrysanthemum Chronicles and uh, when I shared this idea of doing this poem as a drama play my three narrators who are going to be uh, with us soon they did not they not only loved the idea but they supported me that they will uh, not only narrate it but they also enjoyed this poem going through it thoroughly and today they are with me and I hope that together we are able to make you enjoy this intriguing poetic drama. I hope you find it intriguing. So let me first welcome my first narrator. She's also a brilliant poet, Gauri Bhargav. Good evening, everybody. Welcome Thank you. Welcome. welcome to the Vana Talk Show. And today we are doing this live poetic drama. So let's hope that the viewers and the audience really enjoy it. Thank you very much, ma'am. Sure, yeah. Next, I would like to invite my second narrator, Daisy Bala. Hello, Hi, Mona. Um, Hi, glad to be a part of this show. Hello, Gauri, and good evening to all the viewers. Hello. I'm really happy to be a part of this flowing poetry session. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for being part of it and accepting this, you know, unique kind of concept that we have bought and hopefully everybody likes it. Absolutely. So let's, let's welcome our third narrator for the evening, Neeru Agnihotri. Hello, everyone. Here is Neeru Agnihotri. Hello, Daisy. Hello, girl. Hi, Neeru. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine and of course CC's and the Vana talk show is our sister concern page so I'm really really glad those who are also going to join us welcome everybody and a very good evening to all of you and now I'll not uh, take much of your time and I'll ask my request my beautiful beautiful poets and narrators here to begin with the show okay yes so here I begin with the scene one murder over a cup of tea there was no blood on the floor, but a murder took place the prior night. Two pair of empty bone china cups that seemed waiting for the liquor tea to be poured into them, resting inside the kettle made long ago, lying as ice now. The wife made it with love for the husband whose weight was ever incessant for his cup, but he didn't kill her. His love was greater than the spring, as she would often dance in joy of his fragrant love, ever fresh like dewdrops on the petals of the flower she adorned in her vase, that she kept in most corners of this beautiful house. And the mansion even remained filled with the alluring fragrances, said the stout teapot, still holding the stale tea inside her belly, those often made her giggle in between. As the liquid inside her mood, tickling her ceramic body, making the detective agitated by now. A crooked man of mid forties, features sharp with a mustache that seemed like an other knife resting below his nose that sniffed more suspicion in every nook of the mansion. He wore an overcoat with an ironed white chemist, sitting well on his tall and torn silhouette. The lady teapot 
drooling over his looks, was blinking in between her long eyelashes. But the detective seemed an astute man, carefully lifting her with a piece of cloth, observed her carefully from behind his lenses, rotating her white porcelain body. A few times then scribbled some notes on his palm-sized pocket diary that he kept inside afterwards into his black overcoat. Every time the detective walked on the rug spread over the floors, he heard soft murmurs inside the room as he glanced hitherto with his sharp eyes. He felt the velvety drapes over the French door windows. Sheward and Coy, the man went closer, began observing them when one of them had chewed as the detective had tickled with a feather and apparently it was one of the maiden's noses. Scene two, interrogation of the three mademoiselles. The three charming purple pair of maiden were standing right behind the detective as he shook the girls they showed his hands of their French velvet bodies, shrugging the dust off their long gowns. The maidens opened their long lashed eyes and mumbled in rather agitation. Why? Why do you want to know? Ask us fast and we shall answer swiftly. It's time for our beauty sleep. Oh, poor mistress of the house. She kept us resting during daytime. Her beloved husband slept peacefully in, his, in this bedroom without light impeding his siesta. Else he would shout. Our mistress had taught us the ways of satisfying our master. We never raise our gowns to let him see the naked light. We are the good girls, you know. And we followed her words without laxity. She kept us clean, orderly and shining our bodies. That's all we know. He loved her. She loved him. And the story is effortless, like any middle-aged couple of this town. The detective was mesmerized in the lady's words when he was pulled by his collar towards the middle French sister, the flirtatious, she was called. Yes, oh yes, there's one thing you must know, dear. Don't stand so far from me. Come near. Darling, let me tell you their story from the start. How the master found his love. And here goes the story once upon a time. Shh, shh. Don't explain in same old rhyme, jerked the left friend sister, her middle younger one, and she smiled. Okay, my darling, hear me close, hear me close. He was young and spring was near. But suddenly, all the mademoiselles closed. Their eyes stood still again. There were footsteps from behind. No sooner the detective turned, his eyes wide with shock, mouth remained agape. Okay, so scene three, encounter with the suspect, the husband. Well, hello, Detective Long Nose. What brings you here at my abode? Did you again smell crime somewhere or you just plainly followed your long nose? To this, the detective came close, sniffing again from his slightly longer nose. And with crooked brows, he replied, I suspect a murder in your lane. The breeze from your house whispered in my ears. And this dawn, Mr. Husband, I didn't smell any aroma or yawn of your beautiful wife. She does each dawn. And to catch the glimpse of hers, I stand in my galeria. Oh, when she pours those herbs and stirs carefully in the kettle with the delicate hands, I feel she is stirring myriad melodies into my heart. And how, how you are not aware, she is the blossom of this whole town. Her step brings spring every year, even in the most driest existence that have gone by. He makes rain merely when she removes the veil from her youthful face and shows those dark penciled eyes. And as the detective opened his eyes, there was a clout that landed on his jaws and he was thrashed and thrown away from Mr. Husband's mansion. As he fell on the patio of multicolored rocks, he heard giggling and murmuring voices again. 
the doors laughed, and the French windows made fun. The whole house seemed giggling, holding its belly. It was an alive house. Mrs. Wife did it with a caressing and overflowing love that could be seen in every nook of it. In the garden, among the clothesline, where neat sheets hung, and as the guts would touch them, they would flow and take along their fresh elixir to the whole town. And as everybody sighed in sheer joy of Mrs. Wife's presence, someone's heart jumped and thumped even faster. It was her secret admirer, none other but Detective Longnose himself. Scene four, challenge of Mr. Longnose to Mr. Husband. You better run along, Mr. Longnose, before I lose the temper of mine. Killing you, I wouldn't mind if you ever talk about my wife. Roar, Mr. Husband, and shut the huge wooden door upon his face. The poor fellow rose, shrugging off the dust he swore. I shall prove you guilty, Mr. Husband. I shall put you in jail. Not even the gods of your house then shall come to save your soul. As he walked down the narrow brick lane, crossing the green meadows and uphill road, he heard the shepherds whispering that aside. Did you hear Mr. Husband had killed his wife? Ignoring, he walked. Soon he met the milkmaids on his path. He heard those murmurs again. Furious and insulted, he wanted to run. But again at the downhill, he met the potter whose mud came from Mr. Husband's farm. He stopped Long Nose, who was busy sniffing words in the air. Well, hello, detective. Would you like to buy a piece of pot, a cup, a saucer, or a plate, maybe? Stop by and see how gorgeous these are with a shiny body and spring of colors. The potter waved at him. And so Long Nose went to sniff in some mud and clay or some news on his tray as the potter was the teller an old fella with news of all the pots in the town. Long nose stood with a twisted face, expecting to hear some stuff from the potter and not to buy pots, cups, or saucers. The old man gulped his fear and spoke with a voice that shook more than his body. He babbled in low tone. Oh yes, Mr. Long nose, you are right. The man is the murderer. He has killed his wife. I heard the poor girl's shrills that were loud enough to enter my ears in my sleep. Did you see anything, old man? The detective asked with curious eyes. No, the old fella moved his head from side to side. The hopeless detective was exhaling heavy breaths and despaired sighs. You keep an eye on him and call me if need be, puffing and puffing. He came out of the shop, setting his hat and overcoat. His eyes rotated hitherto and sniffing again, off he went. I'll not spare you, Mr. Husband, chanting this again and again. Scene five, Mr. Husband arrested on the day of autumn. Mr. Husband's house now stood quiet with the porch all filled with the leaves dried falling from the trees. An old maple tree was shedding off its worn out leaves and standing as hushed as the house. Peeking through the window where the wife stayed, the curtains were not raised, nor did he saw her silhouette anymore. Lost in doing errands as the husband carelessly snowed, Joyce in her own space, her melodious voice reached to the birds that often perched upon its weary branches, tweeting and fluttering more often on the symphonies. She sung the old tree, uh, wondered, where was the woman? And for a moment thought, has he already really murdered? No, it can't be. He loved her, but if not true, where is she? The autumn has come, the most loved time of the wife, but she doesn't stand anymore in the galleria, knitting those yarn for hours. And as often she dozed off in that soothing breeze, blowing all day long, the old tree became restless. Her absence for long was making him sick. 
And so he whispered the words and sent one maple leaf, his son, on the wings of breeze to the detective's house that stood just adjacent and a little far. No sooner he reached and fell upon Mr. Longnose's ear, the child spilled all the truth. The detective rose from his slumber and riding as fast on his bicycle, falling and tumbling, he came to the husband's house. Bang the door open. It was again ravenous dark from the inside. All the curtains stood dark, tall and uncanny, impeding the lights to enter into that dome. Long nose knew it was the time he slept without to be disturbed, but up he went the stairs, broke the door open of the most luxurious bedroom and nabbed him from beneath the sheets. The culprit was now in his hands, all cuffed up and tight. He was taken to the town's jail, his mouth taped so he couldn't yell, being ogled and washed with despise. By the town's people and few even threw stones at him to show their angst for killing the most beautiful woman of their small town. But the house cried, and so did the three velvet maidens. Even Mrs. Teapot alarmed and woke the inanimate beings of that alive house. She rung and rung the spoon against her ceramic body until she fainted with pain. And the kettle, sitting on the fire, kept whistling to make the news reach those who were the witness of Mr. Husband and Mrs. Wife's divine love. Alas, that day was the most cursed one of the autumns. The biggest lover of the town was caught for a murder over a cup of tea. Scene six, Mr. Husband's trial in the presence of jury and the judge. The rouge, the careless heart, yes, that is him. The mob was excusing as the brawny man was being dragged to the court. His hands tied at the back with a thick rope. He looked hungry and unkept. While earlier his clothes smelled of aromatic herbs, his chamise was ever crepes the whitest in the town, and his moustache showed pride with two ends rising to the top of the cheeks. Like there sat his manly ego. A diamond dazzled on his right earlobe. His terrace was that of richly kempt chap, having the prettiest bride, and now the town despised for having murdered the innocent maiden merely over a cup of his morning tea. The clock tower stuck at twelve. The trial began with a bell. The culprit stood in the wooden box to the left of the lord. Then came the voice of Detective Longnose as he spoke as one of the prosecutors fighting against the charming Mr. Husband. My lord, this man here stands guilty of murdering his wife. The murder was done at the darkest hour with the kitchen knife about 10 days ago. This man who is known for his fetish for tea that only made from his wife's hand who seduced the whole town with leaves brewing in her kettle so long till aroma fine of liquor fled in the air alluring all and soon he turned towards the jury they all near nodded thrice in rhythm and mumbled hmm. see my lord the fox here agreed and the judge kept listening to the varied degrees of long nose charges upon the most silently standing man poor mr husband and asked lightly, wittily to him, Do you wish to say anything, lover boy? The lad remained quiet for some time and said, staring straight into the judge's eyes, Give me day seven and night six. My wife shall be here on the eighth day from heaven. Ah, she will be upset to see me like this. Her love is pure for me. Her beads smell my name spell my name loudly. Every time I loo, she falls within my embrace like an insane woman who needs love. Her body and soul both belongs to me. I couldn't deed such a heinous thing. I wish to see us in one grave, merged in one another. I am her lover and not a single man here could love as I do. Protect her as I do. And so they 
All call me rude. I dare to take stones over my chest. I can. Can anyone for her? And he stared now at the jury, who were all moving their heads from left to right. And so the trial was sustained for day seven, when the murder, murdered wife comes from heaven. Scene seven. Before the second trial, murmurs about Mrs. Wife's ghost sightings. It was past midnight. The town was quiet as much the night was quieter. A peasant, shoddily drunk, walking haphazardly and singing lore, he passed from beside the door. He saw a black silhouette. Into that dimly lit room of Mrs. Wife. Moving hither to inside, the peasant's nerve got loose. He knew it was her ghost, and so he galloped the fastest he could from that haunted site. And the news from his lips spread like fire from years to years and mouths to mouths. The place stood like a bad omen now. Villagers dared to pass. The fright enveloped such. Even the rattle of leaves, gushes of rain, and thunders were all thought her curse. She was wandering into the meadows and hills. They all talked in murmured voices. The trees at nights near the haunted house became uncanny with their boughs swishing, looming to fetch souls of the passers-by. Soon the word got into Long Nose's ear. He stood in his galleria with open, wide eyes, staring obliquely at the end of the lane where in silence stood Mr. Husband's alive home. He knew it was the house playing with all on the commands of its master, so that none comes and finds out the truth. But little did he care when once again with his real long nose that sniffed more and sneezed more just along with rumors, he went in the night when the whole town slept, lost in deep slumber, they wouldn't hear a footstep. Even the house would be asleep. The stout Mrs. Teapot, along those three purple maidens, he needed to be quiet. Not even his own breath should enter his ears. As he tiptoed from the hallway towards the couple's bedroom, opened it after probing the entire house in hope of finding the corpse of Mrs. Wife. That must have rotted by now. He would have to cover his nose. It would be a painful sight, for his love was a Mars, and he would ever have this desire to meet her above in the skies, where the callous husband had sent her, fighting these myriad thoughts. As he walked inside, to his surprise, he saw a black silhouette standing in the middle of the room. His heart stopped a beat. Swiftly, he held the lantern higher to his face to get the view of that uncanny figure that didn't move a bit as he walked near it, trying to touch and know what being in, stood in front of him, a ghost, a banshee, or a sprite, and accidentally pulled the silken black robe. But that was the moment of truth and surprise, both bare and exposed stood in front of him, all alive and beautiful, Mrs. Wife. Scene eight, truth of Mrs. Wife's ghost, the day of the trial and her presence in the court. Long nose hastily covered his face, her skin so fair it glazed and the shine twinkled into his eyes. She was truly a goddess, taken already by Mr. Husband, in these moments, he cursed his fate and for one moment wished to turn the culprit this night as ravenous it was outside. Not a single ear would know what he could do to this fragile woman standing in front of him. Alas, he couldn't and covered her with the robe as quivering she stood with a bowed head and lip sealed for long. The man asked her varied questions, but she refused to utter a word. She shook her head sideways, merely on each occasion, and said none. Agitated, the detective left with the warning. Agitated, the detective left with the warning. Lady, you better make your story ready. 
with dawn's 12th hour the trial shall begin your husband's life depends on you else i shall take you this time and not a soul could come and spare you from being mine he left the house before it awoke he didn't want to be broomed out he knew the house despised his presence as much he irked all of them except that youthful soul he had just left behind missing a chance again to make her his woman and so the cock crowed with dawn's first light on time the trial began with the presence of mrs wife as she sat quietly on the first row dressed up in all her fineries she looked the most elegant but her eyes were wet to see her beloved lover in such a meager state the man who reflected imperial from tip to toe seemed much a beggar staring most adoringly towards his beautiful bride but far in the room crooked long nose was burning as covetous punching his fists into one another exhaling heavy breaths amidst the a crowd of naive villagers who were all shook by the appearance of mrs wife they all were whispering and babbling words when sudden bang of the wooden hammer on the table caught the attention of present all inside the court the judge now spoke louder after clearing his gorge tell me mr long nose how you wish to present the case now as we can all see sitting among us is that lady who had been believed to be murdered by her husband there was nothing he could say so he rose most leisurely and stood with a bowed head the judge then glanced towards the suspect and asked him in a tender voice you mr husband seem much relaxed and you have kept your promise after day 7 your wife is present but the court the jury wishes to know the story where was your wife for this long and if she was alive why didn't she came to salt away you from the oblate there was dead silence even the breathing of myriad souls could be heard mr husband rose limping his browny body weak confessed in his deep voice my lord it's true she was dead scene 9 revelation of truth by mrs wife what are you saying mr husband do you mean to say that the woman sitting here is not your wife but a dead body but he seems much alive to me here than anybody in the court room and the air was filled with laughter who killed her then demanded the judge with a furious face the more tangled and bizarre became the case seeing her husband affronted mrs wife stood and spoke for the first time my lord it was that summer noon when i was doing chores busy in my own world singing lord i climbed the old banyan tree to hook a nail not a rope that would be high so the wash clothes shall quickly dry but the sun impeded my eyes i missed a step of the ladder and before i could hit the earth my husband send the strongest zafir to took me into his arms and fly me to the safest place my eyes were closed in fear opening them i found myself in the lap of my diseased mother she cares me for all this while before i came back again for when i travel the chariot of gust my beloved husband yell from behind I shall bring you back my love do not be afraid we shall meet again on earth i was aware of all down here but the heavens tested our love and sent me back because my husband has given every drop of his blood see this man standing all bones in is my insane lover who passed all tests of the god and this was the last to give of being apart from each other the longest time we haven't parted even for seconds see my man here he was about to lose his breath and up there i pleaded i am here now my love alive and more beautiful than before your precious wife mrs wife then ran embraced her husband kissing him long 
tears were flowing incessantly from myriad eyes in the court with the sounds of blowing noses in between as the two lovers still stood and wind in each other's arms scene 10 the judge's final verdict upon mr long nose's confession soon the judge spoke your story is so stirring but how do we believe you tell the truth is there any proof mrs wife nodded and promptly handed him over the golden document with the signs that made his mouth agape every hair on his body rose in ecstasy as he held the paper from the skies it said i the omnipresent grant her life to this day shall she live into the arms of her lover till death do them part the judge was in tears as he read the heaven's command he set mr husband free but before he banged the wooden ham hammer and announced the case shut he asked with a crooked face so mr longnose tell us how did you get this clue and how your longnose sniffed a murder that never took place at the time of morning tea he said with stammering words popping out in a low voice i i i had a dream it was one of the dawn when all voices were gone mr husband's house seemed silent why there was no aroma of his wife's handmade tea as i tried to peek in with my binoculars i merely saw that man sitting alone on the bed having his tea while other days they both had it together i thought he has killed her in the night for there was no moment of hers in that mad house long nose confided almost breathless speaking rapid to his words the judge made a face and proud asking him again and this made you arrest the man no my lord i had clues i asked the porter the shepherds and the milkmaids to other villagers in the vicinity as well they all had the same dream you know me my lord how we all had a similar dream on the same night i knew something was devious and not right the message was given to us from the skies so i followed and arrested the man perhaps he planned it but didn't work out and so he played off sending her to the heaven on the chariot of wind and now that she had come back they both are pretending innocent the judge now roared with all his might who does that you arrested a man because you had a dream he then glanced furiously at the jury asking them did you all have the same dream the jury all nodded their heads dancing to the same rhythm and there he shouted again never heard of such idiocy in my life you all convicted an innocent man on the basis of your dreams the truth has been shown by the heaven these two are the lovers for life till beyond i set you free mr husband to live alongside your beautiful wife and you mr longnose shall pay the penalty of wasting everyone's precious time and to all the suffering you have caused mr husband and for having amorous eyes upon his wife you shall leave this town within day 6 Here I say the court is adjourned. The lovers came back hand in hand. Their love became precious and respectful in everyone's eyes as they gave way and showered flowers on them. Mr. Longnose hid his face and ran away. The villagers again went back to their chores, had their meals and slept the night away. But Mr. Husband and Mrs. Wife sat in each other's arms counting the stars sitting beneath the vast sky thanking the gods thank you that's the end of the drama <laughs> thank you so much that was a beautiful narration i hope that you also enjoyed doing it and also the audience they might they have also loved it yeah. so uh, tell me tell me gauri how was your experience when you first read the poem 
yeah like it was wonderful i first read through the script and then i actually narrated it uh, narrated it aloud so when i narrated it i actually loved it more because i could feel the emotions and the humor that you have incorporated in it and i just went seamlessly the story was so nice it was so different from what we usually read and uh, yeah that was the feeling so it's outstanding that's all i can say i have no yeah. words to express how good it was <laughs> thank you so much so daisy and I, what was like, your experience yeah gauri you were saying something yeah and i liked all the little details uh, you have added uh, uh, from the beginning about the teapots about the curtains so ma'am i think you should first tell how the what made you write this uh, poetic drama so you should tell the viewers about your experience first before we talk about our uh, experience sure ah uh, well uh, it was like a regular day and uh, it's a ritual in our house that we have our morning tea together me and my husband so when we were having the this tea and suddenly this idea striked and i thought why not write a poem and uh, something uh, you know Uh, relating to this ritual but then there should be something humorous and then these characters started developing as i started writing the first scene and it kept on uh, going and uh, like in scene 8 i got stuck because i was not finding an end uh, finding an end because uh, i was not uh, you know finding the idea that how to uh, conjure the wife how to bring how to show that i she is not dead then my elder son came to rescue and he said mama do something magical do something like uh, she comes back from heaven she is not dead or something like that and then the scene uh, 9th and 10th happened so i changed it into something that this murder never happened it was all a dream and this detective long nose he just sniffed it and he made a you know a, an assumption that she is dead so i could actually it. visualize the characters as i was reading it and i could yeah. visualize that mr long nose is sniffing and the uh, the uh, inanimate objects they are moving inside the house and the stout lady teapot was my favorite with that white ceramic body and i i could mimic her voice that okay she is talking and she is uh, telling uh, narrating the love saga that this beautiful couple in the town is having and how she she has witnessed the murder and now the lady is nowhere to be seen so uh, of course the name is really intriguing and then this narration is beautiful and it flows like this mademoiselle's gowns <laughs> absolutely <laughs> elegant beautiful and flowing so i loved it it's a unique experience i will cherish it forever thank you thank you thank you if i would have been an animator i really would have created the whole scenes and everything but maybe in future you never know i can take uh, help of some animator <laughs> and create it as a movie or something sure looking forward to that yeah certainly so niru you want to share something your experience yes, and all actually there was suspense there was happy ending so everything was going so smooth like we were not getting stuck anywhere so the storyline was so smooth the details of the characters were so good so it was fun reading that and uh, earlier there was suspense and we were like uh, will uh, have she has she really uh, dead or she not then finally we got to know that she is not dead she is just yeah. alive she was in heaven and this was pure love story yeah. so it's like a love story mingled with the suspense saga into a like a poetry and prose together yeah. so it's a beautiful concoction everything was yes. uh, great like suspense then there was a detailing of characters like how they were very much in love with each other how they get lost and how they met like a bollywood movie <laughs> that was beautiful happy yeah. ending is always uh, we prefer yes. yeah that's the best thing na because it should not end in a gloomy way yes. or something so i thought let's yeah. give a happy ending so i would yeah. like to tell the audience here so this poem is already published it has been published in my third poetry book The Devil's Wife with words beneath the cranium. If you permit, I can read a small poem from here. Sure, This please. This whole book is dedicated to the uh, special bond that a husband and a wife shares, and uh, the poems are all love poems. And maybe uh, if you uh, read it, you will love the, uh, I mean, the essence of it. So I'll read a small poem uh, with your permission. 
Uh, should I read the Devil's Wife itself? That why I have given it this title. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, see, this is the prologue. Here's a photograph of Devil. If you can see, uh, can you see? Yes. <laughs> yeah. We can see that. <laughs> yeah. So this is a uh, this uh, book has a prologue and it has an epilogue. That again is a poem. So read the prologue. Uh, the Devil's Wife. Do you know, darling? Even here, they ogle me with curious eyes, whispering in soft voices, which I can hear. How do they forget? I was the goddess you married. I was your beautiful wife. Those colorful attires, which then sat on my tall, vaguely plump body, are not needed much here. I've chosen white silk now and filled my wardrobe with them more. I love the flow of this garment, but I must tell you, darling, it still sits on my youthful body same. And I get those glances again, which you have never liked upon me, and kept me safe within your confines. This place, however, is serene for our love as I wait for your arrival. But men here do gaze. Yes, they want to talk to me, touch me, and make me theirs. They've heard that I was a good wife a man can never have. But don't you worry, I'm still your Padmini, your chaste lotus. And just the way I have lived with you, the landlords here have given me a huge dwelling, and I stay within the confines. But the casements and doors, darling, they are of glass, from which the prowlers sneak, trying to catch a glimpse of me. And so I have stitched long opaque curtains covering them all. But the place seems hollow without you. And also my days and nights, which are longer here than your sigh. I ramble within the mansion, looking beautiful. But to whom, with my red lips, I will kiss the color you often despised when I was with you, and how much you found my womanly possessions all finicky. And waste of your earnings, but in the inside you smiled. After those callous words, which was one of your traits, how could I forget you with the man and I was the wife? And here I live a certain life. The flowers in my garden give me those red lips. The blossoms give my cheeks the blush, and my skin has become my skin has become even more radiant with all the stars close to my abode, spreading the shine. Do you know? I've heard then and still from the men, sprites I hear. They say. They have never seen a goddess who married a devil, but none still know knows it's your name, and not who you are. Oh, you are that brawny man, the most possessive lover on earth. And how I miss your warmth, your embrace, and our corporal love. I must tell you, I still find no man as handsome as you were, living, loving as humans, and creating our kinds. We did. Now, as the book says, I had to depart early, but I'm still. Not accepted here for loving a rogue all my life. Little do I care. I never did then or not. I have seen my relations turning sore. It's your love, my dear husband, that remained absolute. Alas, the heavens still despise, punishing me seldom the aloofness of nights which I have spent earlier in your arms. Forgive my sweetheart. I broke the law of not speaking in words or undying love. I told the truth that you did it all for me. You tore apart the heavens to bring back yours, deceased wife. I still take pride over your possessive love that kept me comforted on earth. Oh yes, I'm the devil's wife who had loved a goddess, and for all my years beside you, only I saw the god in you. Yes, you were my god. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. This really? was the poem that became the theme of the whole book, and then there are many poems. Maybe if you read it, you'll find. So, so this was a really interesting uh, event that happened today, and I'm really grateful to all of you that you, you know, uh, supported me. Actually, in this. we would love so to read more of you. your poems. We would love to read more oh, from your yes. side. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Give us, give us your poems, and, and we will read every poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. But maybe next time we can actually do a script, a proper, you know, fiction script. We can do some drama and maybe some props we can use. So yeah. See. We can stand and do action and then use all the props and <laughs> like a proper stage play with acts. Yeah, <laughs> we have to create some dialogues and all. I've written many stories. So I can change them into script if you want me to, and then we can do something interesting. Sure. So there's a ghost story uh, I've written. Maybe we can do something with it. Let's do something. Yeah, that's a question. Sorry. 
let us read and honor us. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. It will be an honor for me as well. So, uh, with this, uh, and you, uh, and you want to say something, anything, Gauri, Neeru, Daisy, can share anything you want to do uh, if you want to. I, I would like to say, Chrysanthemum Chronicles is a great, great platform for all the budding authors and all the seasoned ones. And all the prompts are awesome. And uh, these uh, one hour uh, live shows, they are giving an opportunity for us to come come and connect with our uh, readers and our writers and also read such beautiful poetry. So it's a learning experience and a winning situation all in all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really nice to hear. So since uh, we are live, I'll just give a, a small happy, happy news that uh, the, all the journals, they are ready to be dispatched on Monday. And maybe by next week, we can have a digital launch and we will invite many more participants who are all part of it. So we'll uh, look, we look forward to see you then. All yes, of you, the audience good. and also the participants. And I have to tell you, I'm sorry, I'm being pompous here. This magazine is super, super, super awesome. Guys, Thompson Press has done amazing job. If you touch it, you feel it. It's so superbly done. It's a premium quality magazine. I'm I'm really uh, hopeful that you, when you uh, you know hold it, you feel that proud sense of proud in yourself because it's really good. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being so pompous. <laughs> <laughs> Say praising ears. We're excited. Yeah. So it was a really, uh, you know, great connecting with every everyone here, the audience who are watching this live. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed this uh, live narration, a poetic drama. And if you want to read more of my poems, you can grab this book from Amazon. It's my third poetry book. Soon my fiction book would be coming uh, by the end of this year. My first debut fiction. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gauri. Neeru, Daisy, for all your support and the beautiful narration you did. I'm really honored. Thank you, ma'am. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. With your permission, now I would like to end this session. Sure. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. And have a Welcome. great Sunday. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And I'm really glad that you took out time from uh, your busy schedule. Of, of course, it's a weekend. But I hope you enjoyed our uh, the narration and the poem, of course, the poetic drama. And if you really want to read more of my poem, I already showed this book. This is available in Amazon, The Devil's Wife with Words Beneath Her Cranium. And I'm really, really happy to connect with you. And I'm really thankful to all the writers who are supporting uh, Chrysanthemum Chronicles. We are actually going strength to strength. And there's a huge news that I will uh, reveal by the mid of August, which I'm going to keep a secret right now. There will be a grand revelation. So wait for that. Thank you so much.